<laughs> All right, welcome everybody to another Mando Lessons Live. My name is Baron Collins Hill. Hope you're all doing great this Saturday morning. Got something nice and warm to drink, or, or wherever you are, you got something to keep you company. Uh, great to see so many folks in the chat already. I'm waking up a little slow. I woke up in the middle of the night and couldn't get back to sleep, so apologies if I seem a little spacey, but it's just what's up. Let's see who we got here. We got Robert, we got Lewis, we got Gary, we got Peter, Denise, Hugo, Sheldon, James, Denver, Dan, Jim, Francois, Green Ted, Hugo. All right. Great to see you all, folks from all over. Looks like mostly West Coast and some Indiana and Minnesota. I got some central stuff creeping in here. Glad you could join us, Denver. That was a little bit of uh, today's jam along tune, so get your mandolin out at any point and play along with whatever I'm doing. Love to hear what people are working on. As always, ask questions. Happy to answer to the best of my ability. And yeah, just uh, have a good time. We got some questions rolling in, but that first tune that I just played that we're gonna jam on at the end is the classic uh, boil them cabbage down. It's a little one part tune in the key of A. If you don't know it, you'll know it by the end. <laughs> it's A part once again, says Ben. Good to see you here, Ben. All right. Uh, Green Ted says, what string thickness do you use? Uh, it depends on the mandolin. On this mandolin, my kind of main, main mandolin, my number one mandolin, my Ellis, uh, I use, uh, Diderio EJ75s, which is sort of their medium heavy gauge. Um, I don't know what the gauges are off the top of my head. Uh, I think the high E is 11 and a half, which is a little heavier than a standard medium set. Um, just gives me a little more. I play kind of hard, so um, I like to have a little more something to push the pick through. But in general, uh, you know, if I have an older mandolin, I'll use medium or lighter gauge strings. I just like the standard phosphor bronze, um, but there's lots of cool stuff out there to choose from. You got elixirs that are kind of slippery. You got flat wound strings that are mellow and last a long time. Lots to, lots to choose from. I think a good, you know, it's worth trying out some different string stuff just to see what, uh, what you like the sound of best yourself. But you know, I'd say on old mandolins, don't, don't go too heavy just because they weren't built to, uh, to, um, <laughs> there goes the old brain, uh, to support such heavy gauge modern strings. All right, let's see. Iwo, Lars from Sweden, good to have you here. Beth, Betsy, Kevin, all right, all sorts of folks in the chat. Great to see you all here. Hope you're all having a great day. All right, Francois is working on Monroe's Hornpipe, a great tune. Yeah, uh, David Benedict, if for any of you that don't know uh, David, he's a great mandolin player. He's got an awesome YouTube channel and Patreon page. And it looks like he's been doing live streams. I didn't catch it this morning because I slept in because I was up all night. But uh, he's been doing live streams on Saturday mornings before mine. So if you want to fill your day entirely with mandolin live streams, that's a good way to go. Oh, a party. No, I thought <laughs> ben says it's a part once again. And I thought that was just a comment on the fact that Boil Them Cabbage Down is a one-part tune. <laughs> but it's a party once again. It's always a party here. The Mando Lessons Live on Saturdays. Most Saturdays. I often just say every Saturday, but I can't make it sometimes. But if, I, if you see it scheduled, it's going to happen. All right, and Ronnie. Well, start the questions flying in. Maybe I'll play another tune just to get things moving here. But... Love trying to keep up with the chat, so don't be bashful. No questions are too advanced or too simple or anything like that. It's all fair game. I'll play a little bit. I'll play another old time tune just to wake myself up. Another A tune.
didn't really stick that landing, but can always. Yeah, it looks like I beat James just by a second of playing an old-time tune. That tune played a little too fast there. <laughs> Thought I was more awake than I was. Uh, was, what was that tune? Ba, 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 da, ba. Speed the Plow. There's a couple tunes called Speed the Plow. I think there's a, an Irish or a, uh, maybe an English tune called Speed the Plow. Then there's at least one old-time tune called Speed the Plow. That one is for the fiddlers out there. Would have been a cross tune, A-E-A-E. I'm just playing out a standard on mandolin. Get a little more coffee in me from my, I'm going to plug my buddy's podcast here. Got the Tread Cafe mug. It's a great podcast if you're into hearing about musicians and creativity in the traditional music world. Uh, my, my buddy Neil Perlman has a great podcast called Trad Cafe. Just sent me a mug. Um, all right, so uh, Robert says... Uh, He's thinking about drilling some holes in his cheaper 1.2 millimeter picks to get a better grip. Any opinion on you on this idea? Yeah, you know, I'd say if you're if you're not you know attached to the pick and it's something you're not worried about if it messes up or doesn't work out, I'd say go for it. That's somewhat uh, somewhat common. Like there's the Wagons or Wegans. I don't know how to say the name, but those white and black picks um, that are great. I've got some around here somewhere. Um, They, they have those speed holes, for lack of a better word. So yeah, I'd say, you know, if you've got some picks that you're willing to potentially mess up and they're not super dear to you, I'd say go for it. And, you know, some people love that. I've seen people, I mean, some people that I know love it when they have holes will just drill holes in their blue chips, you know, $40 picks. But uh, I guess if you if you like that feeling and you're, you like the feeling of have, having holes in the pick, I'd say go for it. Make sure I didn't miss anything else. Got other folks chiming in from all over. Great to see you all. Uh, Menoth says, question. Do you find yourself muting the G and D strings when playing a high section on the A and E strings? Is it okay to brush the G and D, or should you try to keep them freely ringing? Cool. Uh, that's a great question. In general, um... If you're playing, like in that, when I was just kind of playing too fast in the key of A there, I was, I wouldn't say I was muting the string. I wasn't like, like getting a finger on them so they wouldn't make sound, but I was definitely avoiding them when I was on the, the A and E strings. So, uh, what was the tune? I think it part part of it depends on what key you're in. So if you're in the key of A, you've got a couple safe drone strings. Your A and E strings are pretty good just for kind of droning on. And then so if you're playing on, like when that tune goes down low. You know, your, your melody's down here. And if you if you brush those open A and E strings, they're they're within the key, so that sounds good. Whereas the other way around, if you're you know if you're playing up high on the strings, and you hit those G and D strings, that doesn't sound as good. Um, so there's times when there's a kind of a little I don't know if it's a cheat, but it's a, l a little kind of thing that I keep in mind when I'm playing. If you think about what key you're in, you can always play that in like, you know, a lot of traditional keys for old time and Irish music, um, fi uh, like kind of Western fiddle tunes in general. Um, G is a very common key and you've got a G string. So you can always play the string that the key is in and then the string closer to the floor or higher in pitch. Um, so in the key of G, your G string is safe and your D string is safe. In the key of D, D and A strings are safe, and we're talking in terms of, like, drone strings. And in the key of A, your A and E strings are safe. So, um, that, that can be a little rough guide to sort of let you know when, it's, when a, um, a drone string may or may not sound good. I hope that's helpful. Um, 
Yeah, but in, in general, I think it's it's definitely good to, rather than mute the strings themselves, like with a finger, just make sure you're not hitting them with with your pick. And that just comes from doing it a lot and playing around. James says, what is your view of the role of the mandolin in old time? Seems like very few, it seems like a very banjo and fiddle heavy genre. Mandolin seems to have carved out a role for itself in bluegrass, but not so prominent in old time. Yeah, it's, um, it's definitely a less common, uh, a less common instrument in kind of like in old time music. It's absolutely at home there. Um, and you know, bluegrass comes from old time music and there's, it kind of depends on the kind of old time music you're talking about like I think I just kind of try to read the jam that I'm in and sort of figure out you know there's you can find recordings you know there's this a thing with and this kind of goes for lots of music genres like you know with Irish music you you hear like all of these rules like oh there's no pianos in Irish music and there's no like this and that and here's like what you do and what you don't do but you look back at like early recordings and there's pianos in Irish music and there's you know kind of people doing things that today are not quite as kind of traditional sounding but that stuff's earlier than we are now and the same thing with old time music like oh there's no horns in old time or piano in old time or mandolins don't play chords in old time music um you can find exceptions to all these rules in um, old recordings. So, you know, I'd say, like, there's a lot of, in, in general, like, kind of when I think of, like, an old, if I'm at, like, an old-time jam, it's probably going to be sort of, like, North Carolina round peak style, like, the holy trinity of instruments is the, the fiddle, the banjo, and the guitar, and then things outside of that is sort of like, okay, yeah, let's see, let's, like, let's fit them in somehow, but you're probably not going to hear horns. You're not as, like, a lot of that sort of jazzier, raggy influence stuff is not going to be as, there. you're going to be playing in D and A, whereas, you know, there's a bunch of great old-time tunes in, like, F and C and B flat that are a little more raggy and jazzy. Um, you know, so it depends on the, the old-time jam. In general, you know, I think I often will just stick to the melody when we're playing kind of classic uh, round peak style Tommy Jarrell stuff um, but you know maybe if there's not a guitar if it's just a banjo and a well I don't know I think it really depends depends on the group um, that you find yourself in you know if there's people there that are running the event that have particular views I usually kind of just say okay like if somebody's like oh the if you if you get a sense that like mandolins shouldn't play chord I think mandolins are fine to play chords in old time music but it some people might be more um, picky about that. I think it's all, like, in general, my feeling is it's all good. Just try not to, like, overpower other people and um, just listen a lot and you're probably in good shape. Jim says, I use tacky finger to improve pick grip. Yep, there's stuff you can use. Uh, you can drill holes. You can have that kind of tack stuff. Bohemir from Czech Republic. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Robert says, a uh, bit, bit of a di disadvantage to my thinking of having shorter fingers, but he said just to persevere. Oh, no, maybe I missed the earlier part. I might have missed an earlier part of your thing. Uh, the D note on the G string for the G chop chord. Yeah, that's definitely a stretch. Um, you know, I think, the, you know, people will say, oh, my fingers are too short or too long or too uh, stubby or too skinny. Um, I think, you know, you look around and there's, there's mandolinists with all kinds of different shaped hands. You know, some, some people will just say, you know, my hand really is too small or it, it could even just be like your your ability to stretch, like your innate ability to stretch, like, you know, maybe you've been a, like a, like an iron worker for 60 years and you're playing mandolin, your hand just doesn't want to stretch out like it used to. You know, you just gotta kind of make, make kind of, uh, little concessions of like, okay, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna play that big G chop chord. I honestly rarely play that big G chop. And I have no trouble getting my hand there. If I do, I'm usually just playing two strings. So, you know, just figuring out, you want to be comfortable. You want to kind of create 
as close to the sound as you're aiming for, like, as you can get if you want that chop sound, but, you know, you don't want to be in, like, agony or, like, constant frustration because you can't make a particular chord shape. By all means, adapt. Um, as you play, your hands definitely do get more used to stretching out, but, um, at the same time, no reason to, like, push it unnecessarily. Alex wrote, I've been jamming to the famous Jewish folk tune Havana Gila. A great one, and Happy Hanukkah. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of great, um, there's a great, one of my favorite albums is um, Songs of Our Fathers by David Grisman and Andy Statman. A great album full of a bunch of classic Jewish tunes. Highly recommend checking that out. Also, not really mandolin related, uh, Andy Statman has a solo album if you don't know Andy Stabney, he's a great mandolin player, and he also plays clarinet, and he has a great solo clarinet album. Well, it's not quite so. He's got a, a, an instrument, or he's got like a bass at some point and some drums at some point, um, but he has an album called Awakening from Above, I believe, that's really beautiful. I should listen to that one soon. It's been a while. Oh, uh, there's a great saxophone player playing bluegrass. Is that, uh, what's his name, Chris? Can't think of his name but I think I know who you're talking about yeah there's definitely you know you can you can find people playing you know bending bending the tradition all over the place and that's that's great in my book Django yeah I mean yeah you think about Django who was had many fingers missing and still made amazing music Yep, pinky, like if you have a crooked pinky. My friend, when she broke her pinky, just wrote a tune called Lament for a Broken Pinky, and it, it just kind of didn't use the pinky on any of the, <laughs> anywhere in the tune. Have you ever played a domra? I have not. I would love to. I love the sound. Uh, do you ever plant your hand for picking or just your forearm and wrist? Yeah, I don't, I don't plant my finger on the, on the instrument. Um, there's some people that do it and make it work for me if I try to do that it really just locks up my hands and doesn't feel comfortable at all so in general I try not to really not to plant anywhere occasionally I'll lightly lightly plant just behind the bridge with my kind of the palm or the heel of my hand whatever that's called um, But I also, I'm feeling it move, like the strings move under my hand. So if you don't want to lock down, because then it's all in your wrist, and that can get a little, a little stiff at times. Have you ever played Ura? Uh, Kia Ora from New Zealand. I'm unfamiliar with that person or band. I'm not sure. Or, oh, unless, unless that's saying hello from New Zealand. In which case, apologies, I'm not up on my... Uh, salutations from abroad. All right, <laughs> AC is here from Ireland. He's already got the the cabbage on and cooking. Glad to hear it. Yeah, we'll be playing a little uh, boil them cabbage down at the end of the hour. Great questions so far. Thanks for everybody for chiming in. Keep them coming. I'll play another tune here. Play a nice uh, New England tune.
Alright, there's a tune called Batch Elders. Uh, I don't remember exactly when the Batch Elder family was in Maine. Maybe if Benjamin Foss is still here, he can give us a date range. I'm bad with remembering that. I, like, I want to say 1800s, but I can't totally remember. Uh, Batch Elder family in Maine. And that's one of their tunes. Great tune in the key of F. I don't think it's on my website, but I should do it because it's a good one and there aren't too many tunes in the key of f on my website james says got to see uh the sax player earlier this year at celtic connections three weeks of intense shows sessions and workshops in glasgow amazing yeah i would love to get to celtic connections at some point uh, i've heard good things i've had lots of friends that have played there and would love to make it myself someday mike mcgoldrick an awesome musician Involved in a project with an Irish and Klezmer musicians. I think it was the Merc on the Urk. Cool. I haven't heard that one. Gotta check it out. They did a bunch of crossover tunes, including a good version of the Butterfly. Nice. The Butterfly, uh, great Irish slip jig, three-part tune, a little bit of major, a little bit of minor, right up my alley. I often can't remember how that tune goes. That's why I played it, because I could remember at that point. And I'd say I'm probably 50-50 of being able to start that one. That's a classic one. I think it's on my website. If you don't know that tune yet, it's one you'll definitely find to be very common at most Irish sessions. It's a good one to learn before things get starting back up again. Uh, Myra, hi. Thanks for joining. Glad you're glad you could make it. How to play the solo from California Cotton Fields. That one is beyond me, unfortunately. I don't know the tune. I don't know the solo. Um, I don't have any advice on that one, but I would say if there's a recording that you've heard of a particular song, you know, try to slow it down. You can use a website like tunetranscriber.com or uh, a program like Amazing Slow Downer or Transcribe. Slow it down. It might be slow going at first, but just pick it out note by note, nice and slow, and that'll you'll learn a lot from just kind of pushing through it by ear. That's a great um, thing to do, especially if you've got a tune that you're really excited about or a piece of music you're really excited about, you know, it'll give you that little extra energy to really want to push through some of those hard things to do, like learning stuff by ear and transcribing solos and things like that. All right, Ben says, yes, probably mid-1800s based on the tunes, but no it, actual dates off the top of my head. Yeah, I don't know dates as well. I remember there's a often a little, like, information bulletin on the Batch Elders at Maine Fiddle Camp where... Ben and I teach every year. Um, 
but I can't remember them off the top of my head now. I've been looking at it for 10 years, but. Can you talk a little, oh yeah, let me make sure I didn't miss it. Okay, can you talk a little bit about rest strokes and their utility? All right, and Blair from Cabello is here again. Good to have you back. All right, so yeah, rest strokes. Um, I don't really, I definitely use rest strokes. The, the general kind of definition of a rest stroke is when you play through a string and then your pick comes to rest on the next string over. So if I, I'll do it on the G to D string. I play through the G string and the D string is what stops the pick. <laughs> and for me, rest strokes is just a really good way to kind of get some nice kind of follow through in the same way that, um, you know, if you're like playing tennis or golf and you like swing the, the, the club um, or the racket, um, you know, if you don't want to like hit the ball and then stop, that's not like a great kind of mechanical or technique way to, to make something good happen. So it's, it's the same idea with a rest stroke. Is it's just a great way to you know really follow through with a, a with a note and get a good solid sound out of the instrument. And it's definitely a good you know just go up the strings. <laughs> There's something about that movement of getting that follow through right into the next string that really makes the mandolin sound really nice. Um, so definitely something to work on. You know, in terms of like practicality, I know with like electric guitar players, sometimes people will use rest strokes in conjunction with some interesting like pick direction stuff or they'll like kind of use it to, you know, you'll rest through and then immediately do another downstroke on that string. I don't tend to do a whole lot of that as a as a mandolin player playing mostly fiddle tunes, um, but there are ways that people use it in conjunction with other um, other techniques. But for me, I think it's mostly a, a kind of a tone exercise. It really makes the mandolin sound good versus you know kind of pulling back away from the rest stroke. Um, great question, though. <laughs> Jean says, "Always a nightmare to end the butterfly." Yeah, that tune. Really? Uh, that's a weird spot to end a tune. On the second note of the scale, it's in like an E minor. Kind of, it calls out for some kind of slow, noodly ending. Blair says, do you have a tutorial for the tune Five Miles From Town? That's a great tune. Having problem getting that one, not sure why. Uh, I, I know why. It's a very crooked tune. It's really kind of, it's it's a strange tune. It took me a long time to learn. I don't have a recording, or sorry, a tutorial on my website for it. I should make one. Um, there's probably some sheet music or tablature or a fiddle lesson out there somewhere. Um, learned that one from my friend Issa Burke, also of main fiddle camp fame. Um, I'll play it a little bit though. People... And then, oh, another another place I learned it was from the great Raina Gellert, who played it on her album. I, ooh, that's a good question. Which album is it on? She has two albums. She has a bunch of albums, but the two that I know the best are Starch and Iron um, and Ways of the World. I think it's on Ways of the World, but I'm honestly not sure. It's a great tune, though. Um, five Miles from Town. Yeah, so it's, it's crooked. It's in the key of D. If you're a fiddle player, uh, people fiddle players often tune the G string up to A into high bass tuning for this tune. People also start the tune in different places. Some people start with what I think of as the A part. Some people start with the, what I think of as the B part or the low part and the high part. I honestly kind of go back and forth. I'll start with the low part. Maybe I'll play it a little slow and try to like just, you know, one of the things that I'm always talking about is when you're hearing a tune, and this is what makes this tune kind of hard to learn, like really w listening in before you even start trying to pick out no particular notes is just like 
figuring out, okay, where's the A part? Where's the B part? Where does the A repeat? Where does the B repeat? All that sort of stuff. And then like finding little bits of repetition within those parts is a great, uh, a great exercise. So I'll, I'll try to break this tune down a little bit just to uh, kind of show you the parts. So one, I'll start with the low part just because, but if you want to start with the high part, that's cool too. One, two, three, four. tune the parts sound very similar they're just kind of in different octaves with a little bit of difference going on um it's a it's definitely a, a kind of a strange tune compared to a lot of kind of classic tunes that the a and b parts sound very different and they're straight and all that i gotta tune a little bit because i am sounding a little out I was just playing the tune Fine Times. Nope. <laughs> uh, what was it? Uh, five Miles from Town. A great... Uh... All right. Welcome from good old Belfast, Maine. Data birds. Uh, 
I was playing a tune called Five Miles From Town, a great old time tune in the key of D. It's a little crooked, it's a little squarely, but it's a fun one. I also can't totally vouch for all the notes that I play. I kind of play a weird version of it. I don't know where it came from, but that's the gist anyway. Um, cool, I'm glad that was helpful for Blair and Denise. All right, let's see. Uh, a request for Seneca Square Dance. Absolutely, that's a great tune. All right, and Seneca plus one. Happy to oblige. Um, oh, AC says, I keep meaning to say I replaced the nut on my old Gibson A with rosewood. Oh, cool. Sounds amazing with great evenness of tone between open and fretted notes. That's cool, yeah. I don't think of mandolins often as having uh, wooden nuts. It's common on old Martins, though. They, they would have originally, for a period, been shipped with uh, usually ebony, um, ebony nut. Cool, that's, that's a good, I'd love to hear that sound. All right, um, Seneca Square Dance. fun tune. I haven't played that one in a while. All right, let's see. Catch up with the chat here. Hey, Kenneth, good to have you here. What do you recommend is from Betsy? What do you recommend as top 10 Irish tunes to learn? Um, that's a tricky one. I think the best thing to do is kind of a long answer. I'll, I'll give you some random suggestions in a second, but I think the best thing to do, there's a like, once there's sessions to go to again, I think going to your local session and making a list there of tunes that you hear regularly, even if you're not playing a lot, you know, go to the session at first and just sit and listen. Maybe say, oh, I like that tune. What was the name of that one? Get get some names, things like that. 
um, that's the best way to be able to like likely know tunes that you're likely to run into in your area because it, it it varies depending on you know where you live what tunes are popular um the my second suggestion would be go to the session.org which is a great online resource for um tune for mostly irish tunes there's some other tunes sprinkled in there but it's 99 percent irish um they have a list of like most popular tunes searched on the session um and so that's that's probably a good place to go. Um, and then in terms of just like a handful, I don't I don't know if I can come up with a dozen, but uh, or whatever you said, a ten. <laughs> um, the butterfly, what I just played recently, that's a good tune. Um, but but uh, no, Road to Lisdune Varna is a great tune. Miss Monahan's, that's a good one. Um, Swallowtail Jig is a great tune. Um, Out in the Ocean. Most of these are jigs, but there you have it. Uh, yeah, there, that's probably about all I can come up with off the top of my head, but I would check out the session.org for sure. Hey, James, thank you so much for the super chat. Really appreciate it. Uh, however, however donations come in, whether it's the YouTube super chat or I've got links in the description to PayPal. Patreon, um, where you can get access to lessons a day early. Also, I do patron-only live streams, um, probably next weekend for those patrons out there in the crowd. Um, and yeah, really appreciate. It. I've also got merch. I've got T-shirts and mugs and all kinds of stuff. All the links in the description. Not uh, not required by any means, but always appreciated and helps me do these live sessions and put out new lessons every week. Lewis says, too bad he's not awake. <laughs> well, I'm awake now. Got most of a cup of coffee. Oh, actually, an entire cup of coffee in me. Feeling good now. <laughs> I do respond well to coffee. I don't know where I'd be without coffee. Uh, yeah, Silver Spire, definitely a great tune. Also, the Silver Spear, often, con often confused, but uh, two different tunes. Um... Do you ever use a capo on the mandolin? Sure, yeah. Not regularly. Um, you know, there's sort of different... You know, in bluegrass, uh, capos kind of get looked down on because you're supposed to be able to play in all 12 keys and be a little more fancy about it. But um, I love using capos. I think it's a great way to still get access to the open string sound while also having a capo on. I don't know if that's going to... Yeah, good enough. It's a guitar capo. You can get capos that fit better, but... Uh, you know, cable up on the fourth fret and play a G chord and you got a B chord. It's just a nice sound, especially for like, you listen to the folks like Andy Irvine, great Irish multi-instrumentalist. He's got a great kind of capoed mandolin and mandola sound. I love this. You know, you totally, you can't do that without a capo. You can't get that really kind of ringing open notes. You know, if I'm playing in the key of B, I can... It's not quite the same to like try to... That's also me, like, holding down fingers every tiny little spot that I can. You still can't get all that cool complexity that you can with being having those open strings accessible with a capo. Um, so, yeah, I love using capos. I think it's a great sound. Don't, don't, uh, anyone who says capos are not allowed, I would say don't pay them too, mind, too much mind. I think, it, you know, in bluegrass, it can be important to be able to play um, you know, that sort of open 
string ringing sound is not as much a part of bluegrass. It's it's cool. You know, some old time and bluegrass mandolins players would use a capo. Um, but um, you know, there's a it definitely also has its own sound to be able to kind of get that more closed off percussive sound of bluegrass up the neck. Sean says, pick up a D'Addario micro adjust capo. Is that what I'm using? I got this thing recently too. I don't know if it's the same, but zoom around. It's got this little, uh, little screw that you can adjust to mess with the, the tension of the capo so you can make it really strong or really weak. Um, not, this one's not meant, meant for mandolin. Maybe they make a mandolin one too. Um, but it can be helpful because different instruments want a different amount of tension from the capo. Yep, Banish Misfortune is also a great Irish tune. Everybody in the chat, just throw out an Irish, if you, if, you, if you know an Irish tune, what do you think is like your number one classic Irish tune? Just throw it in the chat and that'll definitely give Betsy some... Uh, some good ideas because it really depends you know i only know the ones that i've been around in sessions um and after you do that grab your mandolin we'll play a little bit of uh banish misfortune all right let's see i'm gonna catch up with the chat um hey Callum, good to have you here glad you could join us do you ever do any open tunings or alternate tunings i do i love open and alternate tunings. I have a whole lesson on my website um, on cross tuning or alternate tunings. Um, there's a lot to choose from. Uh, off the top of my head, there's... So with a mandolin, I tend to tune down and then... There's another use for a capo. Um, I tune down. So if like going into fiddle cross tunings, a lot of them, the fiddle strings go up. So you'll go to like AEAE -A -E, or that high bass tuning that I was talking about. In general, on mandolin, I always tune down and then capo up to get to the right key. So with A, E, A, E, on a fiddle, you take your G up to A and your D up to E. But on a mandolin, I take my A string down to G, my E string down to D, and then put a capo on the second fret, and that makes G, D, G, D turn into A, E, A, E. Oh, yeah. Andrew just said Junior Korean's Laradon. That's one of my favorite tunes. Um... I can't remember. I was trying to remember that tune. I can't remember it the other day. But uh, anyway, um, so yeah, there's lots of great tunings, but I would just say, you know, explore them, but also don't crank your strings crazy on a mandolin because there's so much more tension. Um, could do some damage if you're taking three sets of strings, you know, up a whole step. Might break some strings. But yeah, you know, there's calico, A, E, A, C sharp, cross A, A, E, A, E, high bass, A, D, A, E, um... There's dead man tuning D D A D. There's G D A D G Dad. Um, lots of good ones. There's a whole lesson on my website where I go through a half a dozen or a dozen and tell you how to get there. All right, I'm gonna ch catch up again here. He's a capo. Oh yeah, you can use a capo to change when you change your strings as well. That's definitely another good use. Keeps everything in line. All right, Carrie Polka. Hey, that's a good one. Uh, Miss Monahan's also great. Kess Jig, yep. Yeah, this is great. You know, people in the chat putting out their classic tune is the much going to do much better than my own brain. Uh, uh, still a bit of a beginner on the mandolin and improve my skills or hamstring them by also picking up tenor banjo. I'd say grab a tenor banjo too, especially... You know, I always recommend if people have an instrument that they really love the sound of, by all means, go to, you know, some people will say like, oh, I love the sound of octave mandolin, but it's less common, so I don't, I should start with the mandolin. I would say, if you love the sound of the octave mandolin or the tenor banjo, um, play that, you know. Uh, play mandolin too if you want, but, you know, they're tuned the same way, so you can use all of my instructions. You'll have to do some, you know, different fingering because... You, you can't use the same kind of finger, um, you know, frets 
per finger idea that you do on a mandolin. But other than that, it's pretty much the same. You'll learn the things that make it different over time. And you'll actually be putting time into an instrument that you love the most. Um, so, you know, whether it's octave mandolin or tenor banjo or mandola, mandocello, go right for what you love. Because if you're, you know, if you like the mandolin okay, but you really love the sound of something else, but you pick up a mandolin because you think that's what you should start with, you probably won't play the mandolin as much as you would be playing the octave mandolin, so you won't uh, progress as quickly. But yeah, you know, I'd say, especially um, with instruments that are tuned the same as a mandolin, go for it. Yeah, grab, get a cup. As, as you can see, I have a, I'm not one to tell anybody not to uh, pick up other instruments along the way. <laughs> um, G-Dad, yeah. Okay, let's see. Um... Made Behind the Bar, Morrison Jig, Junior Korean, Cash Jig, Sally Garden, and Cash Jig. Made Behind the Bar, also great. My pick slips in between my fingers when I play. What can I do to prevent that? I think a little bit of um, slipping is normal. I think a lot of it just kind of comes down to spending time with the pick. Always have a pick in your pocket, like I do, <laughs> or usually do. I also, I always have a pick in my pocket, and I also never have the pick I want. Um, but, you know, just having a pick in your hand is good to just kind of fidget around with. It really kind of makes your fingers a little more agile. Um, the more time you spend holding a pick and feeling what it feels like to let it slip around a little bit, not a big deal. Um, you'll start to make these little micro adjustments that make it so it doesn't get too far out of line. So you have to like stop and totally readjust. We were also talking earlier, you can use some like some tacky material to keep everything in line or you can some people like picks with holes that are drilled in them um, in general though I think you know just more time spent with a pick in your hands whether you're playing or not is a great way you know I, often I'll just walk around no mandolin in sight I'll have a pick and I'll just like hold it and pretend I'm strumming um, and you can get pretty agile that way Made behind the bar, Irish washerwoman. Yeah, it definitely, you know, often when I go to an Irish session for the first time, I don't know any of the tunes. And then, you know, over the weeks and months and years of going, I slowly learn them until the point where I know most of them. But I never know all of them. There's always people bringing new stuff around. And, the, and also the, like, repertoire of a session will kind of organically shift over time where you play the same tune every week for a year and then everyone kind of like either forgets about it or just gets excited about other tunes and you don't hear it for another year and then somebody says oh remember that one we used to play all the time and then it comes back irish washerwoman is definitely a classic that definitely kind of a fireworksy tune um and a lot of string crossing on that one so definitely the the pick style on that one the picking direction is a little tricky on that one, but definitely a good project. Uh, Galway Girl from Steve Earle is a great modern song. Um, Jim Ward, Sally Garden, Martin Wins, Boy of the Blue Hill, Egan's Polka, Bally Desmond Polka, Coleman's Three. Oh, Coleman's Three. Um, cool. Yeah, that's a great list right there. Write Some Man. Do you ever finger pick on the mandolin? Not really. Um, I've got a pick in my hand 99% of the time. It's pretty hard to the, the string. Um, you know, the strings are so short and there's so much tension on them that you can't be all that loud as a finger picker. I like finger picking on guitar, but uh, on mandolin it's pretty... It's, it's not my favorite. Cool, awesome, great suggestions everybody. All right, we got a couple minutes left here. Let's play a little bit of Boil Them Cabbage Down. So get your mandolin out, get tuned up. We're in the key of A, classic old time song tune. It's just one part, we'll play it not too fast. This is, I just put out a lesson, I think, or it's about to come out. I get a little confused on uh, melodic variation. I think I put that out. Um, and this is a great tune, you know, it's a one part tune, really simple, really short. A great tune to work on kind of a little bit of improvisation and melodic variation to kind of keep things interesting for yourself. Uh, so we'll pass it back and forth. I'll start out by playing the melody and then 
I'll pass it off to you and you play the melody while I play the chords. I'll play the melody while you play the chords. We'll have a good time with it. Um, not too fast. Start out about there. Maybe we'll speed up a little at the end. One, two, I'll play the melody. One string, you go for it. You don't know that tune already it's on my website i got some all sorts of different resources for that one over there uh well i kind of wrap things up here if you got a tune let's go for an irish tune next week i think somebody had a request last week for a particular irish tune if somebody can remember what it is that always helps my brain out but if not we'll pick an irish tune for next week kind of go back and forth just to get a little of both genres <laughs> or those two genres um and yeah i'll catch up with the chat here thank you all for tuning in this week right some man maggie's pancakes great irish tune um snobbishness about not paying about not playing 19 fret banjo and someone said they sound different uh yeah there's some difference between 19 and 17 fret banjo but I like both. Actually, you know, I, I prefer 19 fret banjos, but the two tenor banjos I have right now are both 17 fret, and I'm enjoying those more than I was my 19 fret. Uh, try it on a thicker pick. Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. Oh, we're talking drilling holes. <laughs> Monster grips on the picks to keep them from... Moving around. Coleman's three set of reels. Forgot the one. That's good pick tips here. Blarney Pilgrim, Swallowtail Jig, Cool. I think it was Coolies. I think Coolies was the. Or was it. I think it was. Ugh, I can't remember. Um, uh, I'm just going to pick one randomly. Let's go Blarney Pilgrim. A great tune. It's a three part tune. Let's do Blarney Pilgrim next week.
there's that tune i think i was just playing it i think all those parts repeat but uh i'll learn it again <laughs> off my website and uh we'll all have fun playing it next week not that fast don't worry um thank you all so much for tuning in it's been a great hour these happen every week thank you all for sticking around thank you everyone for the super chats and paypal donations and all those links in the description really appreciate it helps me do all this sort of stuff couldn't do it without you and i look forward to seeing you all again next saturday have a great weekend everybody see you soon stay safe bye bye